the global food chain is not the first thing that comes to mind for most of us when we sit down for dinner. Unless, of course, your favorite brand of pasta is nowhere to be found on the store shelves, as was the case last year. And who could forget milk being dumped and crops intentionally destroyed, all because of a glut caught by COVID-19. So maybe it's time to rethink how and where we produce food and how we get it from farm to table. With me to talk about rebuilding our food systems are Geraldine Machette, co-CEO and member of the managing board of Royal DSM, and Dirk van der Putt, chairman and CEO of Mondelez International. Thank you both for joining us. Really glad to have you here. Um, so I, in my intro, I, I mentioned a couple of the ways we really saw the, the food chain disrupted during COVID. So, so let's start out there. In, I'd like to hear from both of you, what were some of the biggest problems exposed um, within our food supply during the, the pandemic? Geraldine, maybe you could start us off here. <laughs> Yeah, hi Beth, and, and nice to be here. Um, there's obviously very different geographies. And by the way, yesterday we were in discussion with David Beasley of the World Food Program. And, and if you look at simply the food systems from that end, what we saw is that people on the brink of starvation went from about 80 million people in the world to 135 before COVID. And then it doubled uh, because of the pandemic. So what you're seeing is that on top of the challenges of climate, in terms of conflicts, which were the causes before, he came along big supply chain disruptions and also a combination of lower incomes and an increased cost of food. So it is a little bit the perfect storm, particularly for vulnerable populations um, last year. Um, so that's one aspect. The other aspect that we saw very clearly in the pandemic, at least from our side, is that there's been a, a, a real step up in the realization that if you are not in a good health because you're eating the wrong things, you're more likely to get the virus. And even more importantly, you're more likely to get big and serious complications. So things like non-communicable diseases, be it obesity um, uh, or diabetes, have been complicating factors. And that, I think, has stepped up people's realization that your first line of defense is actually the health that you can get through the right nutrition. Got it. Okay. So as you say, a, a perfect storm here. So Dirk, how, how about you? Mm. What have we learned? Well, I, I, we've learned that um, food supply chains are stronger when they're local. And we, uh, as a company, we, we're very focused on having local supply chains. And so our dis the disruption within the company has not been that major uh, for us. Um, I, I know that there's other companies who have a more of a global supply chain that had uh, very serious problems with all the issues that came up through the, through the pandemic. Uh, I would say the other thing that, um, that we have learned as it relates to food and food availability is um, that whenever uh, governments go into lockdowns or oblige consumers to stay at home, is that their consumption uh, changes quite a bit. We've seen that in the US where everybody was now eating at home, cooking and, and so on. So in a way that has been a, a very good evolution, I would say, because people have discovered life at home, have rediscovered cooking and and so in a way that has not been uh, too bad. But uh, in, in emerging markets where people kind of live on a day-to-day -day basis and they go and buy food every day, we sometimes saw, saw very difficult situations where consumers, the stores were closed, they all buy or buy a lot into traditional stores and things like that. They had to close because the owner couldn't get to their store. Thinking about India here, where we've seen some very tough situations and that food availability really became uh, uh, an issue. And uh, it, it was not the same effect as in developed markets, I would say. So you mentioned the, the push toward local regional supply chains, how that really helped you. I mean, do you see, do you think we're gonna have a move toward that going forward and how do we make that happen? Yeah, we, we do it because um, uh, it's important for us to be connected to the local consumer and we're in food and, that's heavily influenced by local flavors, local uh, uh, culture, and so on. And so if you want to do to be like that, and you don't want to ship products around the world, and you want to be as close to your consumer as you can, you need to change your supply chain. And it's, it's uh, less uh, efficient if you want, if you have many plants around the world and uh, smaller plants, but it, it helps you to be flexible, to be agile, to adapt to what the consumer really wants. So if we, if we have to do that, I think there's going to be uh, 
a question that every company has to ask about their supply chain. Do, do I want to get the, uh, the benefits of scale and go more global or do I want the certainty of supply and the adaptation to the local consumer and do I want to uh, go more local? I think it's something every company will have to decide for themselves. Obviously, one of the benefits of um, you know a more local supply chain is reducing emissions. And Geraldine, I'd, I'd love for you to talk about this a little bit. I've heard you say before, and this is something that's said in the industry, you know, that agriculture is both one of the biggest contributors as well as one of the biggest victims of climate change. Explain that a little bit. You know, how did, how did agriculture also become um, part of the conversation around climate and and you know mm -hmm. cutting emissions? Yeah, absolutely. So maybe one thing that's not fully um, known by a lot of people is that actually agriculture is the second biggest contributor to greenhouse gases and at the same time is the most likely victim. Now, why is it a big contributor? Um, well, partly um, because of livestock. Uh, livestock actually um, burp a lot of methane and methane is 20 times more potent as a greenhouse gas uh, CO2. So there's a whole element there, uh, but there's of course a lot of deforestation that goes, it's a lot of biodiversity and topsoil destruction. And in fact, if you take a very big picture, if you have a look at the world in, in 1950, we had 2.5 billion people on this planet, 70% of people were in extreme poverty. You could look at today, we've tripled the number of human beings on this planet. Um, and at the same time, we've actually reduced the number of people in extreme poverty to below 10%. Now, how did we do that? We did that by professionalizing the food systems, by increasing intensity, by separating the production of grains from livestock, for example. And all of these things have been great successes in, in respect uh, because we were able to feed a lot more people but at the same time, we have used methods and ways of doing this that at some point will cause a lot of trouble. And that's where the climate impact and the relationship between food systems and climate is now becoming extremely apparent. Uh, so that's where it's coming from. There are, of course, solutions and technologies to help minimize the impact of food production on climate and also innovations to enable to adjust to some of the you know, the weather impacts and the challenges that climate change is already putting on the food system pretty much everywhere you look. Great. We're going to dive into some of those technologies um, in a minute. But Dirk, first I want to ask you, I mean, we hear people want sustainable food, but what does that mean? How do we define that? Is, is, there, is there a definition? Is that part of the, the issue here? How do you define it as a company? Yes, and I would say we, we want to be a sustainable food company or people talk about sustainable food systems. And, and I think there's two words in there that are important, the word sustainable and, and the word system. Sustainable means that it can be going on forever, that, that it doesn't uh, have an effect on the environment uh, or on, on, on uh, society. Uh, and the other one is uh, a system, meaning that it's all linked. So every company needs to kind of def define for themselves um, on how, um, how that pans out for them. You can do scientific assessment of where your CO2 footprint comes from, as an example. And so for us as a company, there's really three systems that we're very interested in. One is uh, what was Geraldine was talking about is the agricultural side of things, the, our, our supply of ingredients. In fact, that's our biggest footprint on the environment. And those are very complex systems sometimes because it's, it's about the landscape, not just about this one farmer that's growing cocoa, which we use. There might be a farmer next door that's doing palm oil. So it's, it's the intertwining of supply chains. There's social uh, issues related to it. So the whole system that needs to be taken care of. So that's one system. The second system is within our own operations, uh, from re receiving our ingredients to uh, delivering to our clients. And um, those are also uh, quite linked, uh, if you want, uh, but more easy to control because it's really within our control. And then it's what happens from the moment the consumer picks up our product and what do they do with the packaging and so on. And um, I think that's also a system that's very interrelated. and. Um, I, I think you need to think about it that there is a number of impacts, uh, be it environmental, be it social, that you need to take into account. So for us, 
as we think about sustainability, we think about, yes, ingredients, we think about black packaging and plastic in, in the environment, we think about waste, CO2, water in our operations, but we also think about health and wellness of the consumer and that we as a company need to give the consumer the options between indulgent and healthy food. Or we also think about diversity, equity and inclusion as part of our sustainability approach that could go all the way to the ingredients and how do we make sure that those communities that grow cocoa, that there's women that are empowered, that kids are not in child labor, or uh, it could be uh, as it relates within the company, of course, but also the way we communicate to consumer. Is that towards a diverse consumer. And so for us, th th those are all sort of linked and it's not just about the environment. For us, th there's three, environment, health and wellness, and and um, the third one escapes me now, but that was uh, about, uh, yes, the um, uh, societal impact of things. Got it, so it's a broad, you've got a broad, you're having, you have a broad definition here. Um, we actually, we have got an audience mm -hmm. question um, a part, about part of the system mm -hmm. here. Um, the question is around one third of the world's food is lost to food waste. How are you thinking about this problem? And I, I'd love for you both to tackle this. Geraldine, maybe you'll, you'll start. Yeah, firstly, fully agree with you, Dirk. It's a system discussion. And, and we like to summarize it in two parts. There's what do we eat and how do we produce it? Um, and sustainability is sustainability of the people themselves. So what we eat really matters and access to affordable, truly nutritious food is part of driving a sustainable society, uh, whether it's in low income uh, countries or even in high income countries where we notice a lot of the population is actually not having a healthy diet leading to the right kind of outcomes. And then there's the how we produce, which is the whole agriculture um, and, and, and a footprint of food production, food transport. But to your point, the most egregious observation is indeed that we waste a third of the food that is produced today. And we, that is lost in the agricultural space, in the processing, in the transport. Which system has ever really been successful wasting a third of what it produces? So that is a big, big challenge that a, a, from an end-to-end -end point of view requires a lot of different stakeholders to work together. And that's one of the characteristics of the food systems is that it is a space where we're talking about hundreds of millions of livelihoods. Um, this is not concentrated in the hands of a few players. So, so there's a, a lot to be done uh, there for sure. And I would even throw in that um, this is the food waste on the producing food, but there's also a lot to be done in actually using the food waste after consumption to actually create a lot more circularity in the food space than, you know, as we've talked about circularity around plastics, for example, there's a lot more circularity that can happen when it comes to food and organic matter. Um, so a lot of innovation space uh, headroom here uh, as well, which, by the way, if you think about it, if we do a good job, we would already massively reduce the environmental impact of food production. That's a, that's interesting way of thinking about it. So, so Dirk, how about at Mondelez? How how are you tackling the food waste issue or thinking about it? Well, we we first of all think about our own operations. Where, it, the, the, and, and as Geraldine uh, was rightfully saying, if we would have a third of our production getting lost, we we would not be feeling good about ourselves. So it's constantly about uh, trying to make sure that uh, um, uh, our operations have as little waste as possible. Um, we, we work with our suppliers to make sure that um, 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 they are not producing waste or the farmers that they use the full, uh, the full product that they produce, that there is no waste that stays on the field or that, that, that they are not uh, using. And then um, I think the, uh, the other one is, is with the consumer and to offer the consumer options that allows them to save uh, uh, some of that food. So we, for instance, are trying to get uh, our uh, products as much as we can, and we have a stated uh, objective for 2025, to have as much in portion control packs as possible so that uh, they can save the rest and, and that they don't buy a big pack, eat a little bit of it, and then throw the rest away. So we think about that in that sense too. So those are some of the things that we're doing as it relates to to food waste, uh, but it's still uh, quite a, a long way to go. But there are clearly actions that every company can take, to my opinion. So it, 
let me ask a question about this. I mean, does the does the consumer care about sustainability? Right? Is I think we saw during the pandemic we had food shortages. You know, were people more concerned about getting food than they were about sustainability? Has it kind of taken a step back um, in terms of um, attributes that consumers are looking for? Geraldine, I'd, I'd love to hear you on this. Yeah, I, I would argue not at all. Um, in fact, if you look at consumer data, there's two big trends that have come up. And we, of course, are the leading company when it comes to what makes food nutritious. Uh, but what we've seen is that there's two trends in consumers. One is there's an increasing attention to what are they consuming? Where is it coming from? What's the environmental impact? How far has it traveled? How has it been produced, et cetera? So we're seeing a lot more demand, which by the way, to the beginning of our conversation, does also point towards a bit more localization. Um, and the other big consumer trend is actually people seeking to eat in a way which is good for their health. Uh, and, and those two trends, you could have thought that in the middle of a pandemic, that would not kind of happen, but it really has. And we can give you examples. So for example, we have ingredients for the animal space that reduces the methane burp by cows by 30, 40%. The pull behind that is actually huge because a lot of questions are being asked of the dairy chain. What are you doing about your environmental footprint as a sector? Uh, how do you manage your scope three emissions and your impact on the environment? And these are live conversations right now. Why? because consumers are asking those questions. We also have, um, if you look at more the oceans, there's a lot of pushback against, oh, are we over exploiting the oceans? And, and how is aquaculture actually behaving, knowing that actually a lot of salmons are fed with anchovies you know, fished out of the oceans? And, and here, the kind of innovations is that you can actually feed salmon directly from the algae. Um, you know, uh, in some respect, you could say turning salmon vegetarian. Um, and, and that is a way of, by the way, preserving oceans, but also enriching them in omega-3. And, and this is all driven. The reason why these innovations are scaling right now is because consumers actually care and, and are asking a lot more questions than ever before. So let, let's stay on this theme of innovation here. I'd love to hear from both of you to end what technology you're most excited about. You know, what are you seeing? What do you think has ha, could have the biggest potential? Dirk, why, why don't you go ahead first here? Um, I'm, I think it's coming from the digital direction uh, as it relates to what is the most exciting. Maybe uh, not immediately that big. It's going to help with sustainability, but... Um, what we are seeing is that our world is, is changing and the way we run our food businesses is going to be heavily influenced by, by the digital. Uh, consumers buying more in e-commerce, um, the way we communicate to our consumers, the way consumers communicate to each other, how important inter-consumer uh, uh, communication really is, uh, the way we will run our operations, uh, making use of AI, the way we plan for our business and so on. So it's, it's going to affect every aspect of our business. And if you look at the last 10 years, the change we've seen and the change that is coming in the next 10 years, I think that's going to be a massive change. And, and it, it's probably one of our biggest areas that we are really focused on, if, if not the biggest area, uh, trying to understand what it all means for us. Great. And Geraldine, how about you? Well, in, in a short version, uh, basically, it's the realization that climate and food are one and the same crisis and the same battle. And therefore, the, the awareness and the changes of the system behind that. And the other one is actually, Dirk, to your point of digital, personalized nutrition. Uh, we have the technology today to have great relationships and understanding that what you eat leads to different health outcomes depending on who you are as a person. This is at our fingertips. So let's scale it and get a lot more health benefit out of the right nutritional choices. Great. Yeah. Geraldine Dirk, thank you so much for being with us. Really appreciate it.